For a thousand years, kings and queens of Europe had absolute power. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. Greed, revenge, sex, madness, witchcraft, murder. Every monarch had their royal secrets. All societies need justice, even monarchies where royals were above the law. But many kings used or abused the rules of society to their own ends. Austrian Emperor Joseph II issued 10,000 laws trying to create a perfect world. English King Henry VII twisted the law to make himself rich. While Henry II's search for a new English legal system ended in murder, the kingdoms they ruled were beset by law and disorder. England in the 12th century was a violent and lawless place. To bring order out of chaos, King Henry II wanted to create an honest and just legal system for all his subjects. But Archbishop Thomas Becket refused to recognize the king's laws. In 1170, the struggle between the king and the churchmen ended in tragedy, as Henry broke his own laws to settle the dispute. The king's terrible act of personal vengeance made Henry a villain, and Becket a martyred saint. Justice was cruel and capricious in the Middle Ages. Guilt or innocence were often determined in trial by ordeal. A defendant might be challenged to single combat or thrown into deep water to see if God would protect him. Defendants often suffered trial by hot iron. The accused had to pick up an iron bar from boiling water and carry it for 10 paces. After this terrible ordeal, the unfortunate's hands were bandaged for a week and then uncovered to be examined by the court. If the blisters were clean and healing, he would be found innocent. If infected and oozing, he would be condemned. The fate of a condemned person depended on the crime, but the path of justice often led straight to the gallows. Of course, the rich and powerful were immune from the law and its punishments. Many were unhappy with the crude system of justice, and few believed its ancient and barbaric trials to be fair. Among those who wanted reform was the king himself, Henry II. Determined to bring justice to all, Henry set up a system of traveling judges invested with royal power. A plaintiff no longer had to petition the king in person. Judges visited each county, dispensing fair justice in the king's name, not by ordeal, but with witnesses and character references. It was the beginning of the modern legal system. Everyone was to be equal before the law. But the new system was soon tested when one powerful group challenged the reforms, the church. The king's friend, Thomas Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, insisted clergy be tried in church courts. Priests accused of crimes that would cost them their lives in civil courts often literally got away with murder in a church court. Church and state clashed head on. Henry faced a terrible dilemma. Becket, head of the English church, refused to recognize the king's courts. Henry banished Becket. The archbishop's retribution was swift. He excommunicated the king and all those who stood against him. The state and church were at war. England was thrown into turmoil as Europe watched the struggle and held its breath. 
Even Pope Alexander III urged caution on Becket. Since the days are evil and many things must be endured because of the times, we beg you to be discreet. We warn, exhort and advise you to show yourself wary, prudent and circumspect in all your actions, for your own sake and that of the church. Arrogant and stubborn, Becket would not bend, even for the Pope. He defied Henry and returned to Canterbury. When this news reached the king, his furious reaction was to break the very laws he had enacted. Unable to stop Becket legally, Henry uttered the famous words, Who will rid me of this turbulent priest? Four knights were in the room, and they took the king at his fateful word. They mounted horses and rode to the cathedral at Canterbury. Becket was not alone in the cathedral that day. A newly arrived monk named Edward Grimm was with him. Grimm was unaware he was to witness one of the most famous assassinations in history. Along came the murderers in full armor, with swords, axes and hatchets and other implements suitable for the crime on which their minds were set. The knights were determined to put an end to Becket's defiance. Brutal men, the killers saw force as the answer to this clash of laws. As the knights broke into the church, they asked for the traitor Thomas Becket. Becket replied, Lo, here I am. No traitor to the king, but a priest. What do you seek from me? The monk Edward Grimm described what followed. The wicked knights leapt suddenly upon him and wounded him in the head, and by the same stroke they almost cut off my arm. Next, the archbishop received a second blow, but held firm. At the third blow, he fell on his knees and elbows, offering himself as a living sacrifice and saying in a low voice, For the name of Jesus and the protection of the church, I am ready to embrace death. But the third knight inflicted a terrible wound as he lay prostrate. By this stroke, the sword was dashed against the pavement, and the crown of his head, which was large, was separated from the head in such a way that the blood, white with the brain, and the brain, no less red from the blood, died at the floor of the cathedral. Then the knight cried out to the others, Let us away. This fellow will rise no more. As the archbishop's body lay on the cathedral floor, the legend of Becket the Martyr was born. An observer noted the people's reactions at the time. Some of them smeared their eyes with blood. Others brought bottles and carried off secretly as much of it as they could. Others cut off shreds of clothing and dipped them into the blood. At a later time, no one was thought happy who had not carried off something from the precious treasure of the martyr's body. Henry II paid a price for Becket's murder for months, the king begged the pope not to excommunicate him, and he was forced to do penance for his sin. Becket was declared a saint less than three years later. The stubborn archbishop became England's most popular martyr, while Henry lives in history as a villain. But the legal system Henry introduced flourished. Though he had been forced to break his own laws, his foresight forged the backbone of modern British law, but always in the shadow of that turbulent priest. Six hundred years after Henry II changed a system with too few laws, an Austrian king tried to change his empire with too many laws. Here lies Joseph who failed in everything he attempted. Thus wrote King Joseph II of Austria as he lay dying. The weak, sick king was facing a pathetic end to a life of iron will and good intentions. He had once dreamed of creating the perfect society through law, creating heaven on earth by legislation. He ended in failure because he couldn't see that imposing his will for the good of society was in fact a real abuse of his royal power. 
As a child, Joseph was extremely strong-minded. When he was only eight, his mother, Queen Maria Theresa, turned him over to his tutors with a warning. The prince has a violent desire to carry out his will in all his demands. In 1763, Joseph toured the empire he would one day inherit, stretching from Belgium to Hungary, from Russia to Italy. He often traveled in disguise to learn firsthand how his subjects lived. The misery he found among the enslaved serfs made him vow to change their lives. The rich and privileged looked down on the peasants with contempt and treated them as chattels. A disturbed Joseph vowed to change this. But while his mother remained on the throne, he couldn't start his reforms. A conservative, she damned Joseph's plans. In your endeavors to create useful workers, you will destroy the state and bring about the damnation of souls. Maria Theresa died in 1780, leaving Joseph on the throne. At the age of 39, Joseph could now launch his grand plan to remake the empire. He first roused the bureaucrats for the massive changes to come. In an early decree, he ordered that they must not act purely as copyists, nor devote their backsides to sitting and their hands to signing. They must sacrifice their souls, their reason, their wills, and their whole strength to their work. Joseph then equipped his army of civil servants with long questionnaires and sent them out to discover the state of the empire. What is the condition of the schools? Who is looking after the orphans? Is there any provision being made for the blind and crippled? When their reports were delivered, Joseph was ready to create his perfect society. An avalanche of new laws was enacted. He abolished torture and capital punishment. He fed and housed the poor and had doctors treat them for free. He ended serfdom, Europe's form of slavery. And to set an example, Joseph II even took up the plough himself. Nobles always considered themselves above the law, but under Joseph's legal system, aristocratic wrongdoers were led off to face punishment, barefoot and in chains, alongside common criminals. The poor delighted in the equal treatment, but Joseph had made the nobility his enemies. At a time when Jews were persecuted all over Europe, Joseph introduced laws to protect them. The king also lifted press censorship. Not that the presses ever lay idle. In his 10-year reign, Joseph produced over 10,000 new laws and decrees. On average, he wrote two new laws a day. Nothing was too trivial to escape his notice. Are the laws against drunkenness being carried out? Are the houses numbered? Are there any clowns or jugglers roaming the countryside? Joseph became obsessed with controlling minute aspects of everyone's behavior. His laws intruded into everyday life. He outlawed gingerbread because he believed it was bad for the stomach. He required peasants to add vinegar to their drinking water because he thought that would sterilize it. He compelled mothers to breastfeed their infants. He outlawed corsets because he thought they hampered fertility. But when Joseph turned his zeal on the most sacred of institutions, the Catholic Church, he gained another enemy. Since I myself detest superstitions, I will free my people from them. In the process, he reduced the number of saints' days, banned lucky charms, and threw out holy relics. He even specified the length of church candles. Then Joseph banned expensive coffins. To avoid waste, he ordered corpses to be placed in a sack and laid into a newly designed coffin. A hinged bottom opened, dropping the sack into the grave. The coffin could then be reused endlessly. Reusable coffins were the last straw for nobles and commoners alike. 
Facing mass public protest, Joseph backed down. Since so many of our subjects remain so concerned with their bodies, even after death, when they are nothing more than stinking cadavers, His Majesty no longer cares how they choose to bury themselves. Convinced he knew best, Joseph enacted the laws without consultation. He was blind to the resentment his subjects felt for the new rules that governed even the most intimate details of their lives. The intrusive laws backfired. Leaving no corner of life untouched, Joseph managed to enrage everyone. Nobles despised their loss of lands and privileges. Peasants resented their loss of customs and holidays. Protests and riots broke out all over the empire. Some opponents exploited one of Joseph's chief reforms against him. They used the freedom of the press. Articles appeared in the Austrian papers attacking Joseph's laws. The king responded by restoring censorship. Instead of sending bureaucrats to learn from his subjects, he now dispatched agents to spy on them. Finally, the strain of work and his stubborn perfectionism took their toll. Joseph developed tuberculosis. Hearing of his weakness, his enemies seized the chance to rebel against Joseph and demand an end to his mountain of laws. Vomiting blood, barely able to breathe, Joseph faced a bitter choice. Abandon his life's work of legal reforms or lose his empire. Three weeks before he died, he gave in and erased most of his laws from the statute books. I do not regret leaving the throne. All that grieves me is to have made so few people happy. I will agree to anything. Just let me die in peace. He did die in peace, though he kept signing new decrees up to a few hours before his death. He was interred here in Vienna, beneath his mother, Maria Theresa's lavish and ornate tomb. In keeping with his radical dreams, his is the plainest coffin of all in the royal vaults. His sister, Marie Antoinette, was not so lucky. In France, the people demanded the same reforms Joseph's subjects in Austria rejected, and the French Revolution came at a terrible cost. For neglecting their subjects, Joseph's sister, Marie Antoinette, and her husband, King Louis XVI, would lose their heads. While Joseph's laws ended up ruining him, Henry VII of England twisted his laws to make money. Henry did not inherit the throne of England. He took it in battle from King Richard III in 1485. Henry spent most of his personal wealth to finance his rebel army and pay off the nobles who backed him. Henry knew money was power, but though he was king, he was far from being the richest man in England. Many of his nobles had not paid taxes for years and built up huge estates and great wealth. Henry's first measure was thriftiness. He scrutinized every item of the royal accounts, personally signing off every line. But good housekeeping would never refill his coffers. Henry VII and his treasurer, John Morton, devised a scheme to tax nobles without inciting them to rebellion. Turning to the law, Henry and Morton studied old tax rules and realized they could be interpreted in the king's favor. The scam, which became known as Morton's Fork, meant that if a noble looked and acted rich, he could be heavily taxed. And if he looked poor, he must be hiding his wealth, so he would be taxed for the same amount anyway. Either way, Henry VII got the cash. 
To put the law into practice, the king and treasurer Morton traveled around the country with the royal court, inviting themselves to dinner with England's richest men. One of their first visits was to John de Vere, Earl of Oxford, whose vast lands extended for more than a hundred miles across southern England. He lived here at Headingham Castle in East Anglia. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, His Majesty the King. An old friend of the King's, the loyal Earl, had helped Henry win his crown. De Vere's wealth was obvious, as Henry tasted course after course of exotic meats, fine wines, and rare dishes cooked in even rarer spices. <laughs> Nothing, De Vere felt, was too good for the king. As he ate, Henry tallied up the cost of the feast. He included the cost of De Vere's servants, all wearing the silver livery badges which marked their loyalty to the mighty Earl. Treasurer Morton was determined to sample all of De Vere's splendid offerings and produce a profit for his master, the King. At the end of the banquet, Henry bid farewell to his old friend, De Vere. My lord, I have heard much of your hospitality, but I see it is greater than the speech. These handsome gentlemen and yeomen which I see on both sides of me are all your menial servants? May it please your grace, they are most of them my retainers, come to do me service such a time as this, and chiefly to see your grace. By my faith, my lord, I thank you for your good cheer, but my laws must not be broken before my very eyes. My chancellor will speak with you at once. For his lavish hospitality, the host received a huge tax bill. The wealthy John de Vere had fallen victim to Morton's Fork. The king and his entourage wandered from one rich noble to another, gorging themselves at lavish feasts and helping themselves to their host's holdings. And if a rich man's meal was meager, the king would tax his host for being too stingy. There was no avoiding the taxman. For de Vere, Henry VII's visit had an added sting. The livery badges de Vere's men wore marked their loyalty to the Earl, but not necessarily to the king. The footman de Vere gathered to impress his king violated the law against private armies, and another fine was added. Using the law, Henry had his loyal friend fined twice. The Earl's banquet cost him about four million dollars in modern terms. De Vere had to sell several estates to pay the bill and almost went bankrupt. After 25 years of eating and collecting taxes, the king's coffers were full. Henry VII died the richest man in England. Laws cut both ways in a monarchy. Wily King Henry VII profited from the law by knowing how to use it, but the legal systems they constructed crushed Joseph II and nearly brought down Henry II. In the end, not even kings could live above the law.